Um, let's start off with the first part. Uh, I think brand safety probably means different things to different people. Uh, as kind of digital has become more data driven and we're able to use it for efficiency and better targeting, so their um, risks have emerged for some of our clients' brands um, in, in this. And for sort of brand safety is there to mitigate against uh, any risk in the digital supply chain. So whether it's kind of fraud, piracy, viewability, ad blocking, uh, even contractual terms, in any of those areas that allow the client to mitigate any of those risks, pr protect themselves against any of the risks, and in fact address the kind of trust and transparency in the supply chain. And is this a proper job? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's funny, uh, we've, in, in the US probably because of the, the, uh, the amount of volume that went through uh, digital here, we've been uh, really focused on, uh, th through my kind of ops role before this, focused on areas like um, making sure that we have the right, the right data rights and data permissions, and then it got into you know, privacy and then you know, uh, fraud and then viewability and all those sorts of areas. And we had to address them one by one by one. And more, uh, more of the time, more, my, more of my time was being spent on kind of brand safety issues in the US. And I, and I won't say that we, we managed to kind of uh, conquer the beast, um, but we've, at least we've caged it. Yeah. So uh, we've got stuff under, underway, and uh, that doesn't mean that uh, an ad, one of our clients' ads, m may or may not appear on, a, on, a, on an inappropriate site, but we've done what we can to get there. Now what clients, and particularly our global clients, are saying is, good job in the US, guys, but what about you know, the wide world out there, and... Um, you are a global holding company. Th and and so, so more and more, there was a demand for us to roll out all of the things that we've learned in the US. Not that it's identical everywhere else. It's really interesting. I came back from China um, on Saturday, and uh, it's a fascinating market, because if you go in there and say, okay, let's do some brand safety, they say, well, none of the big media owners allow tagging. So that's kind of an interesting thing. There's no third-party ad serving and there's no tagging, so it would be great if we were able to measure viewability and fraud, and, and, and we know that they're there, um, but in order to do that, you have to measure first, and so there are completely different challenges in, in, a, in a lot of the countries, which I'm learning about, so I really aren't, we're not really just going to other countries and saying, okay, well, let's just do what we've done in the US, but we're trying to take our learnings from, from the US and doing it there, and, and then I will say um, that if you listen to Bob Leodice of the ANA, but if you listen to some big marketers, they've now moved trust, transparency, um, visibility into the digital supply chain all the way up their agendas. And some of them, I was with a very, very big marketer, in, multinational marketer in China, the very biggest, um, who've now made it their number one priority for the next year is to, is to increase trust and transparency. So this thing could not be, it's probably a little fortuitous. It wasn't. This didn't happen in September, it happened now, but um, it's, it's certainly sort of, if, if you like, I, um, the, the wave has caught up to me now. But it, I, I imagine to, in some large degree that's because of what happened with Mark Pritchard, right? Mark laid down the gauntlet and had a bit of a call to arms for the industry um, and effectively said that the media supply chain is, is murky at best, but fraudulent at worst. Yeah. And I've got to believe that that's changed your world. Yeah, I mean, I, I th two things changed my world in the last uh, in the last month. Certainly, when um, the uh, the chief brand officer of the biggest advertiser in the world, the biggest marketer in the world, stands up and says, "This now has to be taken care of." We, it's not as if we've not been doing anything, and a lot of us have been putting a lot of effort behind it. A lot of agencies have been putting a lot of effort behind it. But when Mark Pritchard stands up there and says that, then people will take notice, and. I think it's terrific. Um, it, it really, uh, of course, it's accelerated uh, the discussions. Uh, we've got a lot more client uh, telephone calls saying, what are we doing in this space? And, and, uh, but, I, but I really welcome it. And I think uh, everybody who's involved in the, in the supply chain, from agencies all the way through to uh, kind of open networks and, and open exchanges, uh, realize that now we've got to, we've got to deliver. And uh, we've got to, we really have to fix the trust issue when I kind of, those are ugly words, you know, kind of murky and, and, and lack of transparency fraudulent. and fraudulent. Yeah. They're just really ugly words, and I, I don't want to work in a business which has got that stuff in it. None of us want to. 
And so when you, when you hear those things and somebody of Mark's stature saying those things, it just really means that it's got to a level now where we, we really, really better sort it out. Yeah. And, and so what does that mean when you say we've got to sort it out? How is Group M responding? So, I mean, this is going to sound a little complacent. Honestly, we've been doing all of that stuff really hard. We've been trying really, really hard for the last three or four years. And, and of course, if we'd had this conversation 18 months ago, ad blocking wouldn't have been an issue, but suddenly that's an issue. Yep. Um, nobody's talking about ad blocking at the moment because they're all talking about contextual brand safety. So these new things um, catch up to us and need, uh, and need addressing all the time. But I think what, what, what the industry is going to do is it's going to provide greater transparency at every single level. So from agencies' own contracts and getting clients to understand our relationships between ourselves and our clients, um, there's gonna, there'll be a lot more transparency there because of the work that the 4As and the ANA have done around, around transparency. In our dealings with uh, clients are really worried about what they call a waterfall. Is If I, if I spend um, uh, a million dollars on media, how much goes to the medium and how much goes to intermediaries? I want to know that. Yep. It's not necessary that any of those things are wrong. I just want to know exactly what goes where, and we, we, we have to tell our clients that. And honestly, this might sound glib, but we just have to provide the transparency that they, that they require, or, or, they'll, or they'll go elsewhere, they'll, they'll, they'll figure out another way of, of getting it. So, and there's no reason for us not to, um, to show, show complete transparency in the marketplace. I, I've, I've often had conversations with clients about the waterfall and say, it's actually a very simple equation. If we, if we spend 10 cents on an optimization modeling program, uh, let's test it for two months, and if that 10 cents doesn't pay back its, um, itself, then let's take it away. Right. But let's justify each of those costs or th those intermediary costs in the waterfall. And this is a complex business, and complexity attracts uh, intermediaries. That's just the way, it, that's the way it works. And it doesn't mean it's wrong. I just clients want real, real, real transparency in the space, and they... They, it's, it, it's funny, um, I, I joke when, when I talk to um, new, new markets about what I do and what we're trying to do, is I'll say to them, let's try and avoid conversations with clients that start with, do you mean to tell me that? <laughs> it's an awful way uh, to start a conversation. And I remember uh, two, two or three years back when the viewability, um, uh, the, the the, the whole question about viewability happened in our marketplace and we hadn't figured out how to respond yet. Um, I had a multinational client phone me up and, and they actually started the conversation that way. He said, do you mean to tell me that so 40% of my investment has not been seen by anybody over the last three, four years? So could you go to those vendors and ask for, my, for the money back, please? And, um, and then there was some tap dancing to do. And, and of course, um, Ultimately, you can justify things, but you're always on the defensive when you do that. So if we as a business can start going to clients and saying, here's how digital is complex, but it's extremely measurable, and this is how we can use that measurability to make sure that we understand what the fraud is, what we understand what viewability is. There's a lack of viewability in every medium in, in the world. If you think about any medium, if you turn away from that medium, it's not viewable. If you page past a print ad, it's not viewable. If you walk out of a, a room or turn to your friend to talk whilst there's a television ad on there, it's not viewable. And if we can um, explain to clients why viewability and fraud measurement is the next iteration in understanding um, kind of or getting visibility into the digital supply chain, the conversation switches around completely. They say, okay, it, it sounds like you guys are on top of this. That's really interesting. So if we can get to our clients, explain to them what we're doing, justify what we're doing, justify why digital is good, because it's measurable, um, and how we can make it more viewable and more fraud-free, and how we can counter ad blocking with better quality. Um, that's how I think the, uh, the, 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 the transparency conversation can turn around. To, to what degree are the agencies and your clients taking responsibility for some of the fraud and viewability issues we have? I mean, frankly, if we didn't go out into the digital ecosystem with this cost per view, cost per click expectation, um, we wouldn't be in this world of bots and fraud 
the brands and agencies effectively created the problem and are now complaining about taxes that are being put on every media dollar that are ultimately th their own responsibility. If, if, we, if we looked at media as, as being having a brand value and, and truly dr driving brand awareness, mm -hmm. brand impact, and ultimately sales, as opposed to saying, we want to we wanna do X number of impressions, and as a result, we expect a certain number of views, and we expect a certain number of clicks. Didn't, didn't the brands and agencies ultimately create this problem for themselves, and, and are there any responsibility being taken for that? Yeah, we've, we blame everything on the publishers, you know. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really interesting, and it's a complicated question. I, I'm, uh, I'll call myself an evangelist for quality metrics. I'm, uh, I think that measuring raw impressions um, is, a, is misleading, and I think that we, we've got ourselves down to now um, is where um, our business is procurement driven. Procurement have latched onto this thing called a CPM. Um, I think we're past cost per click, and or, you know, yep. because we're in, you know, there's proper branding money coming into here now, and so we're um, uh, so we're into the CPMs and and and, and procurement. Oh, that's great. So lower CPMs are good, right? Absolutely. So okay, well. If your CPMs are $10 this year, they need to be $8 next year. And of course, those of us who are media planners, that's easy. It really is. Like, to lower your CPMs is fine. But the fact that there may be fraudulent and non, an, un, an unviewed inventory in there, there absolutely will be. So um, what we're going to clients to say is we have to start measuring on um, a cost per human viewable metric. Because why would you want to measure um, anything that's not going to be seen by a human or not going to be seen by, by anybody because it's out of a viewable frame. And they say, well, doesn't viewable fraud-free inventory cost more? And we say, no, actually, it saves you money because if you're paying, generally speaking, around the world, viewability is at about a 50% level. And fraud is somewhere um, south of 10% if you control it. So if you add fraud and viewability together, you know, more or less, um, you, you know, you're getting somewhere between 55, sorry, 45 and 50% of your, of, of your true impressions being seen. Yep. So a $10 CPM is in fact a $20 CPM, right? That's right. Um, except that that's not the numbers that the procurement guys see. So what we found in Group M is we have agreements with around 150 what we call valued or preferred, preferred partners in the Group M trusted marketplace. Um, we have agreements on brand safety within that, pricing and, and um, and a whole bunch of other um, quality considerations to be part of the Group M trusted marketplace. Uh, if you're transacting on, uh, uh, on those impressions, um, our, we found that our pricing has increased a bit. Um, I won't give you the number, but it's not much. So that, but enough to, for the procurement guys to say, hang on a minute, your CPMs have gone up by, let's call it 30%. Your CPMs have gone up by 30%, but we say that's saving a client an enormous amount of money because you have to, you have to agree that an ad that can't be seen has no value. It's the, it's the way I start all my presentations. It's like, does that make sense to everybody? And everybody nods, and then when you get to the cost equation, I say, well, you know, isn't this more expensive? And you actually say, so if you can keep your media costs down to anything less than 50%, brand safe inventory is the bargain of the century. Um, so, so I think in a complicated way to answer, a complicated way or, or a roundabout way to answer your question, I think that the, the quality metrics are absolutely vital to our business, and we have to change the conversation from raw tonnage, raw impressions, over to something that means something because um, it's being viewed by a human in the right, in, in a safe environment, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the right context, in the right um, target audience. And if all those things work together, then um, that's invaluable. And, and it's kind of why I'm doing this job, because it's, it's more than just making sure that clients' ads aren't seen on, on far right-wing or far left-wing sites. That's, I guess, part of it. But it really is the value behind it. Um, and if we, can get this, if we can get this done, it adds 40% of value to, yep. um, to, to a, a brand's, a, a brand's um, you know, kind of value uh, uh, inventory. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, so correct me if I, I misheard you or I'm misspeaking, but if, if I understood what you said, what you're saying is that brands have recognized that 
40 to 50 percent of their inventory is not viewable, and whether they've taken a, a responsibility for that or not, we can address later or not. Yeah. <laughs> I can see where that's going. But if they're willing to pay double, then they are effectively taking responsibility and they're acknowledging that between themselves and the publisher, there's a shared responsibility. At, at the end of the day, they want to ensure that they're getting to a person, not a bot, mm -hmm. um, and that there's some quality um, behind that person, that it's not just any person, but it's actually the target audience of whom they're trying to reach. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, absolutely. And if we can, if we can optimize to the most human viewable impressions, um, we can. And that's why we've put so much effort behind it. Um, and uh, that's why if we, can, if we can increase the price by this much and essentially double the human viewable exposure, um, it's, a real, it's a real bargain. So that sets us up pretty nicely for a recent news story. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw up a slide um, here in the room. So for those of you that haven't seen this press, this was an article that broke in the London Times. Um, and although not timed perfectly with Mark Pritchard's remarks, um, they were pretty close, um, especially around the points of the supply chain being murky at best, right? Um, I've got to imagine that this article is changing as well a lot of what's going on. This is, this is getting to a human viewable impression, but it's putting a brand in a pretty bad spot. Yeah, th this, is, this is the second part of the, of the, of the, th of the conversation that really changed, uh, uh, changed my life. And this happened in the UK, um, where I don't think that um, using technology for, for brand safety is, is, is quite as advanced as, as it is in the US. It's, quite a, it's reasonably advanced, I would say, but probably only, I don't know, 20 or 30% of clients are probably using something like a, a moat double verifier or a grape shot for contextual brand safety. And the truth is that, that's, I mean, it's a scary headline for any brand, for the, the, the brand that was, was, uh, was up there, Sandals, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very scary thing. The truth of the matter is that there's probably only pennies going to that ISIS site, but that's not the point. Um, the, the real damage here is reputational harm. Firstly, um, it used to be that if, if a newspaper didn't catch you doing something like that, you might be able to get away, get with, away with it. But now there are websites specifically focused on finding brands that support far, far left, far right um, sites, and then it'll get tweeted into the um, kind of out there. Social and, sphere. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, into the social, into social sphere. And so the first thing that'll happen is that you'll get called out, your brand will get called out by millions of people, it'll be shared, but worse still, it, you know, your brand might be on the front page of the, of the London Times. And that caused an enormous amount of um, concern from uh, any large clients, and I've been talking to probably two or three big clients a day uh, since that article happened saying, are we okay? We, we were very lucky in that we didn't, and again, hopefully it's not just luck, yeah. but um, our, our brands weren't, weren't featured. Although there have been a couple of occasions where on, through kind of video platforms, where we aren't able to measure um, our ads are appearing on, and that by the way was a YouTube video of an ISIS recruitment. And so it's not possible for you to block ads um, from going there. You have to rely on the uh, Facebooks and, and Snapchats and, and Googles of this world to prevent that from happening, which is, we can, and I'm, I think we're probably gonna get there. Yeah. You want it to be controversial, we will. <laughs> um, but but uh, it's, a, it's a really scary thing for, for clients, and that's a small part of brand safety, but suddenly that's become what brand safety means to um, to all of these clients. And honestly, it's, it's preventable as long as you can measure it. Uh, our technology providers, there, there, are, um, there are a number of them, but um, kind of the very tech companies like uh, Double Verify, Grape Shot, um, IAS, have got sophisticated technology that can firstly look at a URL, look at the, the website name, look at the links to the website, look at the metadata around the website, and look at the semantic filtering, the, the, the context of the thing. So if it has any hate speech or if it's got words like ISIS in it or if you're an airline, 
rather than avoid the entire travel category, you can look at words like fire, disaster, crash, you know, any of those words. And if, yep. if it finds those words, you can block it either before the ad goes out or even pre-bid. So it's become really sophisticated now. And I think, as I said earlier on, it doesn't mean that um, uh, you won't see ads on those sites. It's almost impossible to pre pre prevent it completely unless you're operating off a whitelist. Um, and that some of our clients do do because they're very, very cautious. But even if you're operating off a blacklist, there are around about two and a half million sites um, on, uh, on a big network like GDN. So uh, it's really hard to stay off absolutely everything because these sites are coming up all the time. But if you don't use those technological precautions, um, then it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, if, if sure as nuts, it's going to happen. Well, see, that's a great point. Y you can use them so long as that's possible and they exist. Um, the industry's talked a ton about walled gardens. Um, we know that those walled gardens are closed. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in fact, in the broadcast space, you know, many of the broadcasters have talked about creating their own walled gardens, which we've urged against. Um, what are the ramifications now for Google or a Facebook or a YouTube being that they, they are closed and th that you can't use a grape shot or a double verify or some of these other measurement capabilities uh, in, in those environments. It, it's an uncomfortable conversation with clients because clients are saying, okay, well, that's great. So firstly, when we talked about that technology of using semantic filtering, of course that works really well in display on mobile and, and, and um, on desktop, but it's m much more difficult with video yeah. because you, have a, you could have a, a um, an entirely reasonable looking person like Gabe, but he could be saying really, uh, you know, uh, things that could make any brand uncomfortable on a video. You, so you wouldn't know that by looking at the person, by looking at the environment. You might see something about the, from the URL or from the website name or some of the metadata around it, but you won't know that that was a bad video for your brand unless, until after it was, after you, after it was analyzed. So firstly, video is pretty difficult, and it requires a lot of diligence and a lot of human intervention. Um, and the one thing about a walled garden is they tend to be safer because they are controlled by giants like Google and giants like Facebook. So the level of fraud in those environments tend to be lower than that outside. And I'm talking about in their owned and operated, not outside in the, in, in the, uh, in the, open, in the open networks. But the problem is when something like this is discovered and we have no control, we can't tag, we can't block, um, it makes clients extremely uncomfortable. And so if clients are saying, well, we're spending a heap of money with these guys, what's happening? We're getting, and I mean, I, I, I think Google and Facebook are very worried about this area as well, and I know that they're doing a lot around it. But I think what Mark Pritchard's calling for and what we're calling for is just um, transparency into that supply chain. Allow us to tag our ads on their properties with the assurance that we're not going to retarget that data, we're not going to, um, we're going to preserve the, the privacy and all those sorts of things, because I think that's the main reason why, uh, or the main reason that's given that uh, they don't want to let outside tags into their environment, they're worried about their consumer privacy. But every client that I've spoken to has asked that same question, and I have to give them the uncomfortable things that we don't know. We can just talk to Google and we can talk to Facebook and we talk to the other guys that don't allow tagging and we are encouraging them to take every precaution that they can. Why aren't you, why aren't you suggesting they pull their money away well, until it's th solved? This is where I was going and I think that it, it's interesting because we've been having these conversations and when I say we, um, not minions like me, but Martin Sorrell and Sheryl Sandberg um, and Mark Pritchard and Sheryl Sandberg and and Neil Mohan and uh, Eric Schmidt, at that, at that kind of level, you know, at sort of my boss's 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 level. And nothing's really happened. A little bit's happened. The, uh, Facebook have allowed mode tagging in, but uh, we, can, we can measure it, but we can't do anything about it. We can't block, we can't do any of those sorts of things yet. Um, and until clients move investment from A to B, I don't think that anybody will listen. And There's this no may well be, yeah. And this may well be the catalyst that starts that. B uh, both Google and Facebook have got extremely powerful media properties. We can't deny that for a minute. Our clients are going to take all their investment away. But if clients are sufficiently uncomfortable, and I think that they're getting there now, 
those conversations are starting to happen um, at the moment. And so maybe that awful um, uh, headline in the Times, maybe Mark's um, call to arms will be a catalyst now to create proper transparency into the digital supply chain. Because un un until the clients start moving the money, uh, and a lot of those relationships with Google and with Facebook are direct with clients too, or are certainly influenced by direct relationships. And until, that, until the money moves, um, nobody will take notice. So there's, there's been a lot of implications around transparency on both sides of the equation. a and a, uh, effectively accusing agencies of, of impropriety, and, and obviously agencies and brands for years have been saying that the publishers are doing dishonest things, and certainly with 3MS and other things, we've proved that they're doing dishonest things. Um, how do we tackle transparency moving forward? At the risk of sounding glib by being transparent, uh, honestly, there's nothing to hide anywhere. Um, uh, agencies don't have anything to hide. I think what we have, what what is what is what we've realised in this process, and I was on the transparency team that met with the ANA, and I was on the 4A side of the transparency team, and what became clear is that clients and agencies need to construct their contracts in a way where everybody understands exactly how things will work. Right. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, one of the things, I, I saw a talk by Bob Leodis today where uh, he, re he reasserted that, not, that fact, which is the big, one of the biggest things we have to do as clients is, um, is truly understand what's in our contracts. Some of the contracts were years and years and years old and the agencies were completely compliant. Um, but perhaps there was something in th those contracts that was uncomfortable to clients at this time of the um, of, of the relationship. So that's the f that's the first part, um, and I think that th th that's happening. Um, our on the on the vendor side, absolute transparency between um, how the money is being used, where the money is going, um, what's viewable, what's not viewable, what's safe. Um, w what we have to rebuild with uh, with clients is trust, and every time something like fraud or viewability or ad blocking or a story about piracy and clients ads landing up on pirate sites every time something like that happens it erodes a little bit more trust and then we've got to grab scrabble it back and then something else happens like you know and and um it just seems sometimes if you were to imagine being a uh, a, a media manager for a big brand or a brand manager for a big brand and th thinking at the beginning of your fiscal year well, here's sort of $50 million. Should I be moving it across from television into digital? And then you read about the next uh, or the latest um, kind of transparency crisis in media being ad blocking, being, being fraud, be it, be it viewability. Uh, I can imagine that, that brand manager thinking, mm, maybe not this year. And, and if for those of, for those of us in, in the room that are publishers, the biggest opportunity for growth in digital is from major brands. Major brands are still underspent in digital compared to um, the, the overall attention in digital and the overall um, spend proportions in digital. Um, I think you'll, you, you might get some organic growth from direct and from B2B, um, but the real growth is gonna come from, from, from brands. And we have to make sure that the clients trust and, and all, all all transparency answers, uh, questions are answered um, before the major money will flow. It's a, for, particularly for premium publishers and for, for publishers accepting video, that's the big opportunity is to convince brands that we're a worthy channel and we're a safe channel. So in that, in that vein, with regards to viewability and transparency, um, 3MS has, has done a lot for the industry. Um, but had, has 3MS effectively just letting the is it effectively just letting the coyotes in the hen house? Meaning, most of the folks that have helped to make those decisions are publishers. Um, there's some brands and agencies that wait mm -hmm. in, but do we need to rethink what we've established as the current viewability standard? Well, I, I don't know. I, I have conversations about people with viewability. Firstly, I think the 3MS was overdue. The the Agreed. the, the uh, the definition or the non-definition of an impression uh, wasn't sustainable. We needed a, a, a new definition, and we came up with a viewability definition. And I, and I think that 
uh, what the MRC came up with, which I think was a, was a, was a good start. Um, we called for flexibility in that so that we could measure other areas and negotiate with our, with our publisher partners on, on, a, on a different viewability standard. And I have conversations with some publishers and, and even some industry leaders who think that um, viewability hasn't gone as well as it should have gone. I, th I think the opposite. Um, I was talking with one of our clients the other day who embraced, who's really embraced this area of brand safety and has really moved money from less compliant publishers to more compliant publishers in the fraud and the viewability area. And we looked at where viewability was um, two years ago, um, both on the MRC standard and against the Group M standard. And um, uh, against the Group M video standard, 21% of video inventory met our standard two years ago. And in fact, so much so that our teams were worried whether we would get sufficient reach in, in various target audiences sure. and stuff like that. But by doing, having great conversations with some terrific publisher partners and by getting those publisher partners to optimize against viewability, that number's gone to 60% now, from 21% to 60%. At the same time, the MRC standard, which was around 45%, has gone to 75%. Right. And so the entire, I think that the amount of quality inventory available to us in this marketplace has more than doubled against some standards and gone up hugely against others, which is great news because if clients see that, and we shouldn't be holding our heads saying, oh, woe is me, and there are two standards and all this sort of stuff. We'll be showing them these standards saying, look how quality is in, has, has improved. Yep. And, and uh, I think that we should, be st we should stop talking about the possibility of 50% non-viewability and the possibility of 45% fraud. And there are a lot of people who are, interest, who are self-interested enough to be able to paint the, paint the, uh, the world in, 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 in a dark color because it, because it obviously um, uh, improves their, uh, their chances to sell their product. But the, uh, the quality that's improved and, and th with these standards, you can, get, you can now get much higher uh, uh, um, levels of viewability and a virtually fraud-free environment if you use the right precautions and the right technology. So I think we're in a much, much better space but we like talking ourselves down. I mean, 3MS isn't over. Uh, um, it still needs to go to the, the next level and we still look, look cross device. And, um, but I think in terms of mission one, uh, if not accomplished, we're really uh, on our way there. I'm, I'm extremely bullish about what we've achieved. And it, I know it's not been easy. Wow, it's not been easy for agencies, but particularly it hasn't been easy for publishers. But at the same time, it was never easy for us to be able to go to clients and say, please accept that you're going to be paying for 70% viewable inventory or 60% viewable inventory. Yep. It doesn't work. I know a lot of publishers and the IOB had said, said well, let's set the standard at 70%. So it means that 30% of my stuff's not being seen. How do you have that conversation with a client? You know, it just didn't, it didn't work, which is why um, we, had a, we, we developed a more robust standard and, and uh, uh, we have, uh, I think, upwards of, if not 150, upwards of 130 or 140 um, publisher partners who have bought, uh, bought into our, our brand, brand safety standards and, and we're, we're doing great business with them. Excellent. Uh, but John, thank you so much for a great Thanks discussion. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, thank you.